Well, thank you, Stephanie. And it is, uh, it is a pleasure to be here. I, uh, and I'm sure everyone that's, that's, that's been here, especially people from predecessors from Illinois and Indiana that are here, just are thrilled to be here in this setting. It's just beautiful, and you can see why Robert picked this site for his home. Um, and I'm, again, I'm thrilled that, that the, uh, there was no shutdown, and I was able to get on a plane and come here without any problems or complications. Um, and so thanks to Stephanie for making all these arrangements, putting together this series, and then uh, sharing some worry over the email and phone uh, last week. But uh, what, I, what I want to talk about for the next little bit is, as Stephanie indicated, Lincoln's home, Lincoln, not only the home, but, but Springfield itself from, from its foundings, um, and, and try to intersperse a little bit of dis historic descriptions of the community, what it was like, along with, of course, getting in there, the Lincoln family as it relates to the home itself. Um, and then we'll finish up with a with, uh, discussion of, of our site, Lincoln Home National Historic Site, of which there, if you didn't grab a brochure, there's one in the back of the room there. Um, it's four city blocks in downtown Springfield. It's now the National Park. Um, and you know, Lincoln lived in a variety of places that you've learned about over this, this winter series, um, from that log cabin in 1809, um, and of course to the White House and the Soldier's Home, and those are the most common bookends that we associate with Abraham Lincoln. But what I'm going to talk about now is that place where he spent 17 years of his life. And, and I sometimes joke when I talk about Lincoln home, and, and it is, as you may know, going from, to, if you visit various Lincoln places, you, you go to birthplace, and they say, well, these were the most important years of Lincoln's life. <laughs> then you go up the road to, not, or to the boyhood, and, well, these were the most important years in Lincoln's life, and the most formative. And, and, and of course, I'm here to tell you that the Lincoln Home in Springfield is the most important and formative. Well, no, not really, but but as, you know, and, and what you guys have gotten is a great perspective is that, as you know from your own lives, every place is important to a person's life and development and formation. So, so, so what what this is is one chapter of Lincoln's life that we're going to talk about here. Now, Springfield was settled in the 1820s, and from that, at that time, it was just a cluster of cabins, um, not near the town square that, that we have today, the old state capitol square, but, but removed a little bit at 2nd and Jefferson Street. Now, the immediate area contained natural features that were appealing for a frontier community, as you might guess, uh, forested valleys, stream drainages that provided trees to supply fuel and building materials, water and fertile farmland. Now, around here, of course, that's no big thing, but on a prairie state, to have those drainages in that wooded area was a pretty important place, a pretty important reason to settle there. Now, the wide expanses of prairie did surround the town at that time, believe it or not, were not considered to be good farmland um, and were an intimidating feature for those early settlers in that area, both in trying to uh, uh, farm it um, until uh, Mr. John Deere and others came along with the, with the plow. It was, more, it was difficult. Um, and, and um, early settlers, for a variety of reasons, were intimidated. One of the reasons they were intimidated by the prairies was prairie fires. An Illinois uh, prairie fire was uh, described pretty dramatically by a traveler in 1835, and, and, and he recorded, the last 12 miles we traveled after sundown and by firelight over prairie, it being on fire. This was the grandest scene I ever saw. The wind blew a gale all day. The grass was dry and the fire being in the prairie at a distance. As the dark came in, the fire shone more brilliant. A cloud of smoke arose on which the fire shone below and the reflection could be seen for miles. In some instances, 40 miles away it could be seen. By this means, we had in view at one time from one to five miles of fire in a streak burning from two to six feet high. In high grass, it sometimes burned 30 feet high if driven by fierce winds. So you can see where that might be a little intimidating to someone out on the prairie. Now by 1831, Springfield's town center had started to shift to what we would know now today as the Old State Capitol Square, specifically around Fifth and Washington Streets. And that's where merchants were beginning to build more substantial structures. But the town had a long way to go, as was opinion by a traveler who was passing through in 1832. He, quote, he commented that, quote, the houses are not so good as those in Jacksonville. Now, that's the town over about 40 miles from Springfield. Always this rivalry between Springfield and Jacksonville. This guy liked Jacksonville better, evidently. Uh, he said a considerable portion of them being log cabins yet still in Springfield and the whole town having an appearance of dirt and discomfort. Not a 
tourism brochure, that's for sure. <laughs> Uh, young Abraham Lincoln arrived in Springfield in April of 1837, and, and you learned um, last month about where he came from in New Salem. He, everything he owned was in two saddlebags, and he went to begin his law career. He had just received his law license uh, the previous September. He, he became the junior partner of a law head, uh, firm headed by John Todd Stewart. It was John Todd Stewart who actually encouraged Lincoln to study law when they were together in the state legislature in Vandalia. Uh, Lincoln, uh, like Lincoln, Stewart was a native of Kentucky, uh, native of Kentucky, mm -hmm. and uh, who had encouraged, uh, as I said, Lincoln to study law, and they were both Black Hawk War veterans. Stewart also had a cousin living down in Lexington by the name of Mary Todd. Mm -hmm. Now, in March of 1837, a month before Lincoln's arrival, the Sangamon County had authorized uh, the transfer of the public square uh, to the governor for construction of the state capitol building. Uh, the Illinois legislature, who was led by Lincoln and others in that area, had recently voted to move the state capital from Vandalia up to Springfield. And by May of 1837, workers were busily removing the old Sangamon County Courthouse uh, in preparation for the construction of the new state capital, which is shown here about 1860. This is what's now a state historic site, but then, of course, it was the, the capital building. Uh, Springfield had a population of approximately 1,000. Uh, in 1840, uh, well, in 1840 it was 2,600, and then you can see how it grows, 1850, 5,100. So it's growing rapidly. Springfield, I think, was a lot like a boom town when that state capital moved there, as you might guess. People that were involved in state government moved up from Vandalia to Springfield, and there's just a lot of construction, a lot of growth going on. Just for comparison, I need to update this now, I guess. The 2,000 uh, population of Springfield is 111,000, just to kind of give you a reference today. Now, while uh, Springfield held great promise, it did prove to be a challenge to navigate. And this is just a, a modern interpretation of all the streams and drainages that were in Springfield. Here's that state capitol square. Um, in 1846, the Springfield newspaper, the journal reported that, quote, within a few rods, about 50 feet, of the public square, there is a descent of some 15 feet into a ravine. Now, get around here, that's probably a pretty mild uh, descent. but. Uh, um, into a ravine, and we yet have ponds about that are loathsome to the eye, and which, when hot weather comes upon us, will be sickening to the smell. The crossings of our street are covered with mud, and even some of our sidewalks are rendered almost impassable by accumulations of the same article. Now, according to historian Paul Angle, who wrote a great history of Springfield, he said, second only to mud, as a subject of public spirit and indignation, was the hog nuisance. Hogs ranged at will through the streets, wallowed in the mud holes, disputed the narrow sidewalks with pedestrians, and rooted up the boards at frequent intervals. Now, despite these challenges, uh, prospects were, were bright in Springfield for, uh, for this newly designated capital city that contained, as one observer described, a town square with, quote, handsome edifices. So it wasn't all bad, but yet still had, quote, the humble log cabin, the abiding place of the first settlers. Upon his arrival, Lincoln was befriended by Springfield merchant Joshua Speed, who offered Lincoln a place to live above his store at the southwest corner of Fifth and Washington. So that would have been, again, here's the Capitol Square, and that's where Speed's store was. Uh, the bustling town was the largest that Lincoln had ever lived in by that time, and he must have taken some satisfaction, I think, as he walked to work. His law office was in Hoffman's Row right here with Stewart. Um, knowing that he had a hand in, in all this growth and activity in helping to bring the state capital to Springfield. However, Lincoln was a little unsatisfied with life in the city. Uh, he wrote uh, in a letter, quote, this thing of living in Springfield is rather a dull business after all. At least it is to me. I am quite as lonesome here as ever it was anywhere in my life. I have been spoken to by but one woman since I've been here. <laughs> and should not have been by her if she could have avoided it. <laughs> I've never been to church yet, nor probably shall not be soon. I stay away because I am conscious I should not know how to behave myself. Now Lincoln did have an opportunity to meet some people that were probably in a social circle that he wasn't used to running with. Uh, one of Springfield's most prominent citizens was Ninian Wirt Edwards. He was the son of the former Illinois governor, Ninian Edwards, and the husband of Elizabeth Todd Edwards. The Edwards home, which is pictured here in a later photograph, uh, was on the west, what well, was then the western edge of Springfield, but now where the current, our current state capitol building sits. 
um, and overlooked the young town. It was a place of many social func functions from where uh, the oldest sister, Elizabeth, uh, worked to find husbands for the Todd sisters that came from Lexington. Um, in 1839, 24-year-old 20, uh, 24 Frances uh, Todd married uh, William Wallace. And that same year is when sisters Mary and Anne arrived in Springfield, 1839. Mary had visited uh, earlier, but then stayed permanently in 39. Anne would eventually marry Clark Smith in 1846. And 20-year-old Mary Todd was enjoying her time in Springfield and the grand affairs that her sister hosted here in the Edwards home. Uh, and it may have been where, where Mary and Abraham first met. Now that relationship of theirs had advanced far enough by 1840 that they had apparently discussed marriage. Something happened, however, uh, that called off the engagement later that year, and, and as you may know, Lincoln was devastated at the breakup, and he fell into one of his bouts of depression that he, he would refer to as the hypo. Lincoln and Mary had their supporters, though, in Springfield, uh, which must have helped Lincoln to reconsider marriage again. On October 5th, 1844, or 42, rather, Lincoln wrote to his old friend Speed, who by this time had moved to uh, Lexington, Kentucky, and he asked Speed if, if he was still happy with his decision to marry, and he was anxious for a reply. So Speed went off and got married, so Lincoln says, well, what do you think? And uh, Lincoln wrote, you have now been the husband of a lovely woman nearly eight months. Are you now in feeling as well as judgment, glad you are married as you are? Please answer it quickly, as I feel impatient to know. So, so Lincoln must have liked Speed's uh, response um, because on, on November 3rd, 1842, Lincoln went to the home of Episcopal Reverend Charles Dresser, uh, who lived, just happened to live at the corner of 8th and Jackson Streets in a, young, a small cottage, the home that the Lincolns would eventually purchase. Um, and he wanted to arrange for Dresser to officiate the wedding, his wedding to Mary. Lincoln's other preparations, including asking friend and fellow attorney James Matheny if he would be his best man, and he visited Chatterton's jewelry store on the west side of the public square to pick out a ring and have it engraved, love is eternal. The following day, November 4th, 1842, Lincoln was standing with Mary in the parlor of the Edwards home, exchanging wedding vows. Now the newlyweds moved into the Globe Tavern, which is the building here. Um, a two-story frame boarding house located on Adams Street between 4th and 3rd in downtown Springfield. Uh, within a week of the ceremony, Lincoln corresponded to a friend with an update, quote, nothing new here except my marrying, which to me is a matter of profound wonder. In May, he wrote to speed of, quote, coming events. We are not keeping house but boarding at the Globe Tavern, he wrote. Our room, the same one Dr. Wallace occupied there, the room and board only costs $4 a week. I reckon it will scarcely be in our power to visit Kentucky this year. Besides poverty and the necessity of attending to business, those, quote, coming events, I suspect would be somewhat in the way. Two months later, Lincoln provided Speed with another short update on the family with, quote, we are but two as yet. Now that description would change with someone you recognize there, I'm sure. Uh, uh, that description would be inaccurate within days of its reporting as Mary gave birth to Robert Todd Lincoln on August 1st, 1843. Life in the Globe Tavern was uh, challenging for Mary, taking care of a baby, but she received the help of fellow boarders. A six-year-old little girl, Sophie Bledsoe, lived at the Globe Tavern with her parents at the time of Robert's birth, and she recalled years later how her mother helped Mary, and she recalled that Mrs. Lincoln had no nurse for herself or the baby. Whether this was due to poverty or more probably to the great difficulty of securing domestic help, I do not know. But my mother went every day to her room in the hotel, washed and dressed the baby, and made the mother comfortable in the room tidy for several weeks till Mrs. Lincoln was able to do these things for herself. In late 1843, the Lincolns briefly rented a small cottage uh, downtown where they lived, stayed for several months. But Lincoln's growing law practice soon provided the family with the resources in which they could buy a home of their own. And they found Reverend Dresser's cottage uh, at the cor northeast corner of 8th and Jackson Streets. And these are models uh, in one of the houses uh, that we have exhibits in within the Lincoln home. Uh, Lincoln began negotiations uh, with the home's owner, Reverend Dresser, and they agreed in early 1844 that, that Lincoln would pay $1,200 in cash and transfer a piece of land worth $300 to make the purchase price for that cottage $1,500. Uh, the Lincolns moved into their home on May 1st of 1844. At that time, the house was, was five years old. 
Um, it was constructed in what was known as the, as the Elijah Isles addition to the city of Springfield, sometimes referred to as what today might be a new subdivision for Springfield um, as Springfield grew. Uh, within a year of its construction, um, so 1840, the news, a newspaper reporter commented on the growth of Springfield. And he said that uh, Springfield has improved more than twice as much this season as in any former one. Capitalists are beginning to build quite largely, and real estate holds a high price, especially near the most business part of the city or around the capital. Now, this is a, a watercolor that you have in our site brochure. And this is Springfield 1960, but it gives you a sense um, of what this newspaper article was talking about. He said, yesterday we took a survey of our city from the top of the new state house. Well, they were up there looking around. Uh, which afforded us a view of all parts of it. We could see in every direction new buildings going up and among them some very handsome. The small enclosures near the city that have been in cultivation for several years are giving way and buildings are stretching out into the prairies in every direction. The, the part where, uh, where most of the building is going on is Major Isles Addition, so that's that area around the Lincoln home. There's the Lincoln home right there. Uh, it was Major Isles edition, which but three years ago was Naked Prairie. Mr. Lincoln's new home uh, was constructed on, on what was a small knoll uh, that rose slightly above the intersection, which always enhanced then the, the appearance of the house. Uh, it was this modest one and a half story frame cottage, a classic Greek, Greek revival style, had a center hallway with two rooms on either side as you went in, then a small stairway um, up to an attic loft space. Not a whole lot of room up there. Um, so it had a, you know, a parlor, sitting room, kitchen, at least that's what our interpretation of it, near as we can tell. Um, and then uh, the kitchen wing was centered off of the back of the house. This attic cloth space would be a little tough for a guy six foot four, by the way. <laughs> now the backyard would have the typical outbuildings of the time period, uh, maybe a, a wash house and kitchen barn, of course an outhouse, and maybe they had a, a cow and some chickens and things in the backyard at this time. Lincoln's practice with his first partner, John Todd Stewart, ended in April 1841, and Lincoln became the junior partner then with Stephen T. Logan, another of Mary's cousins. Logan and uh, Lincoln set up practice on the north side of the square, um, the same area where he was before. But then two years later, they moved to an office um, on the south side of the square, the place that's currently the Link, uh, Lincoln Herd Law Office State Historic Site, in what's known as the Tinsley Building. In 1844, then Lincoln became a senior partner for the first time with Lincoln and Herndon, and they stayed in the law office until we think about 1852, and then moved back to the west side of the square. On March 10th, 1846, Mary gave birth to their second son, Edward Baker Lincoln, named for one of Lincoln's best friends and colleagues. It took several months, but Lincoln reported the event to his old friend Speed, and in this update, he or in this letter, he uh, updated. Uh, gave Speed an update on young Robert as well, and he said, we have another boy born the 10th of March last. He is very much such a child as Bob was at his age, rather of a longer order. Bob is short and low, and I expect always will be. I wonder if Robert ever saw these letters later in life. He talks very plainly, again, this is Robert, almost as plainly as anybody. He is quite smart enough. I sometimes fear he's one of those little rare ripe sort that are smarter at about five than ever after. <laughs> he has a great deal of that sort of mischief that is the offspring of much animal spirits. Since I began this letter, a messenger came to tell me Bob was lost. But by the time I reached the house, his mother had found him and had him whipped. And by now, very likely, he has run away again. <laughs> now Lincoln as you probably know, had served one term, unremarkable term, in the U.S. Congress from 1847 to 49. It was during that time they were gone, they rented the house out, but it was also vacant so they could make some additions and changes to the house. And so that middle episode of the house, one of the things they did is, remember that, that kitchen wing was centered off the back. Well, what they did is slid the kitchen wing, literally cut it and slid it over to add a bedroom down, downstairs. Finally give Lincoln a little more headroom. Um, and then that's when we think they also painted in what we later refer to as Quaker brown color. Um, and then the upstairs basically stayed the same with, with loft space. But um, so, then, so now you have a, a downstairs space. Lincolns didn't have long to settle into this uh, remodeled home before tragedy struck. Young Eddie Lincoln was fighting for his life. 
Eddie had long been referred to as a sickly boy, but in December 1849, his illness was more serious. Mary cared for him as best she could as his fight against tuberculosis continued for 52 days, but he finally succumbed at 6 a.m. on Friday, February 1st, 1850. Episcopalian Reverend Charles Dresser was not available, uh, so Reverend James Smith, who had recently arrived at the First Presbyterian Church, um, consoled the Lincolns and officiated at Eddie's funeral which was held at the Lincoln home at 11 a.m. on Saturday, February 2nd. Following the services, Eddie was taken to Hutchinson Cemetery, which was eight blocks to the northwest of uh, the home for burial. The Lincolns notified the community of their loss in a, a small entry in the Illinois Daily Journal um, that's, that's right there that simply says, died in this city on yesterday morning at six o'clock, Edward, second son of Honorable A. Lincoln, age four years. The funeral will, funeral will take place at 11 o'clock from the residence of Mr. Lincoln. Then several days later, an anonymously submitted poem titled Little Eddie was, was published in the Illinois Daily Journal. Um, most think that Lincoln wrote it. Perhaps Lincoln and Mary both contributed to this, to this poem. Lincoln concluded a letter to his stepbrother, John Johnson, with, quote, As you make no mention of it, I suppose you had not learned that we lost our little boy. He was sick 52 days and died the morning of the first day of this month. It was not our first, but our second child. We miss him very much. Now, the Lincoln so appreciated the, the help of Reverend Smith that they began attending the First Presbyterian Church. It was at the southeast corner of 3rd and Washington. Now, Mary attended more regularly than Lincoln did, and Lincoln actually never officially joined, but he did pay uh, pew rent for the family. Many years later, Mary wrote to Reverend Smith, quote, that from the time of the death of our little Edward, I believe my husband's heart was directed towards religion. Now, happiness returned to the Lincoln home with the arrival of Lincoln's third son, William Wallace, on December 21st, 1850, uh, named for Dr. William Wallace, who married Mary's sister, uh, Francis, in 1839. Uh, the Wallaces <coughs> lived just, just a little ways from the Lincoln home. The family greeted their fourth son, Thomas, or Tad, as he was called, um, on April 4th, 1853. Tadpole, uh, as Lincoln called him. Now, in this, this other arrival of Lincoln, Lincoln home, we don't have a specific date. Nothing's been documented, documented but Fido the dog arrived at some point uh, and joined the family. Now, uh, Mary's sister Emily also spent time, about six months, in 1854-55, uh, with the Lincolns, and she later recalled that Mary had read the novels of Sir Walter Scott to young Robert, who, uh, who then was seen reenacting one of the novel scenes in the yard. And uh, Emily recalled that, quote, one day hearing sounds of strife, we ran out to the window. Bob and a playmate were having a royal battle. Bob, with his sturdy little legs wide apart, was wielding a fence paling in lieu of a lance and proclaiming in a loud voice, this rock shall fly for, firm from its base as soon as I. Mary, bubbling with laughter, called out, Gramercy, brave knights, pray ye be more merciful than you are brawny. <laughs> now, other friends and neighbors also recalled Lincoln's time with his children. Uh, a neighbor who lived in the, uh, just to the east of the Lincolns commented that Lincoln would take his children and would walk out on the railway, uh, out in the country, talk to them, explain things carefully, particularly. He was often seen pulling young William Tad in a wagon through the streets of Springfield, sometimes also recalled losing one of the boys off the back and being oblivious to that, what just happened as he was thinking or reading. Uh, he would sometimes brought them with him to the law office on Sunday mornings when Mary was at church. Uh, Lincoln's law partner Herndon recalled his frustrations at his partner's indulgences with William Tad. Uh, Herndon wrote, uh, his children did much as they pleased. Many of their antics he approved and he restrained them in nothing. He never reproved them or gave them a fatherly frown. If they pulled down all the books from the shelves, bent the points of all the pens, overturned inkstands, scattered law papers over the floor, or threw the pencils into the spittoon, it never disturbed the serenity of their father's good nature. By the mid-1850s, with their family uh, larger than it had ever been and with Lincoln's legal career proving very successful, the Lincolns decided to remodel yet again. Now, this one uh, was funded in part, we think, from uh, uh, Mary receiving $1,200 from some real estate that her father owned in the area that they sold, and then a settlement of their father's <coughs> estate after her father in Lexington had passed away. 
But basically what they did was added a full second story to the house. It was no longer just a one and a half story cottage, but a full two story house. And then, then the bedroom space was finally able to be all moved upstairs. And then what was that back bedroom then became a rear parlor or Lincoln study. Um, uh, Mrs. Lincoln focused by May of 1856, and this was done in 1854-56. Uh, she focused on interior decor. Uh, she basically made the house very stylish, um, uh, as you might guess. While there were certainly bigger houses in Springfield at this time, this was probably considered one of the most stylish. The Lincolns enjoyed entertaining in their uh, large home, and they planned a large gathering for February 5th, 1857. And actually, with Lincoln's help, Mary wrote 500 invitations, <laughs> stating, Mr. and Mrs. Lincoln will be pleased to see you Thursday evening, February 5th at 8 o'clock. Mary, Mary reported on the affair to Emily uh, on February 16th when she said, Within the last three weeks, there has been a party almost every night, and some two or three grand fets are coming off this week. I may perhaps surprise you when I mention that I am recovering from the slight fatigue of a very large and, I really believe, very handsome and agreeable entertainment, at least our friends flatter us by saying so. You can just hear Mary uh, saying these things. About 500 were invited, yet owing to an unlucky rain, 300 only favored us by their presence. <laughs> and the same evening in Jacksonville, Colonel Warren gave a bridal party to his son, which, there's that Jacksonville again, which occasion robbed us of some of our friends. And we always, you know, the house was larger, but, you know, 300 people. But what, um, what was explained to us once is that this time, if you remember, the invitation said at 8 o'clock. So it was, I think they, it was explained to me, they put certain times, expected people to come at that time. But I guess they expected them to leave, too, uh, before the next group came. And so it was more like an open house. Uh, the Lincoln boys also had parties, recluded in the festivities. On December 23rd, 1859, Mary hosted a party to celebrate Willie's ninth birthday. She wrote out an invitation stating that, quote, Willie Lincoln will be pleased to see you. And that's one of the invitations that survives. Uh, Willie Lincoln will be pleased to see you Wednesday afternoon at 3 o'clock. Mary described Willie's party uh, in a letter to a friend, quote, Willie's birthday came off on the 21st of December, and as I had long promised him a celebration, it duly came off. Some 50 or 60 boys and girls attended the gala. You may believe I have come to the conclusion that they are nonsensical affairs. <laughs> However, I wish your boys had been in their midst. Now, the Lincolns also took part, both as hosts and visitors, in the New Year's tradition where on New Year's Day, hosts would open their doors to visitors before the bowl games came about, I guess, <laughs> open their doors to visitors who would go from house to house throughout the day. In uh, 1860, Mary wrote to her friend, quote, tomorrow I must rise early as it is receiving day, which was what they called it. A Springfield resident recalled this tradition as she experienced it when she was a young girl, quote, I can remember the great hurry and flurry that stirred the household on this festive occasion to get the parlors to a comfortable degree of temperature, for some early birds came about 9 o'clock, and they were generally quite old birds that should have known better. <laughs> In this icy atmosphere, eggnog was very tempting, and many a young gallant found it hard to stand upright about 6 p.m. <laughs> At each house, the caller was expected to eat oysters, chicken salad, drink coffee, down a saucer of ice cream and cake, and nibble a few bonbons. So that was receiving day in Springfield. Lincoln did, of course, enjoy the social activities, but was never far from law and politics, as you know. In 1854, he entered the political fray to run for United States Senate, his first attempt at the U.S. Senate seat, and lost. And he tried again in 1858, and he entered, as you know, a series of debates with incumbent Stephen A. Douglas that captured the nation's attention and we really think then catapulted him into the presidency two years later. Now Mary and Robert attended that final of those series of seven debates, the attended the one in Alton. They had taken a train from Springfield with Robert traveling with a group of Springfield cadets that had formed during the summer in Springfield. Now a notice of their formation appeared in the paper in the previous June and um, which listed the officers and non-commissioned officers, including 4th Corporal R.T. Lincoln. And then they went on to describe this group. It said, uh, we have heretofore omitted to notice Springfield Cadets, a new military company lately organized in this city. It is composed of young men from 16 to 20 years of age and is under the charge of Major Thomas S. Mather as commander. 
The uniform of the company is a dark blue coat made after the fashion of the United States uniform, trimmed with gilt lace, white pants, and glazed cap. The company, although it has been under drill but a short time, has made a very rapid progress. So picture young Robert marching around in his uniform while his dad was debating Stephen A. Douglas in Alton. On election day, November 2nd, 1858, Illinoisans went to the polls to vote for state legislatures, of course at that time, who then voted for the United States Senate. It wasn't a direct vote of the people at that time for U.S. Senate. Lincoln no doubt voted, but more than likely did not participate in the activities that were reported in the following day's Illinois State Journal. One headline said, illegal voting. Now, no Illinois politics jokes here, please. <laughs> a number of persons were arrested on yesterday for illegal voting and failing to give bail were committed to jail. The next headline, street fights. This species of entertainment was not as numerous on yesterday as might have been expected. The city prison was pretty near full, however, at sundown. And then the final headline is one that we can relate to after, after any election cycle is headline after election. The election being now over, we intend to make the journal more acceptable to the general reader by giving attention to matters that have been thrust aside as consequence of the intense political excitement from which we have just emerged. This change will doubtless be as agreeable to our readers as it will be to ourselves. Now Lincoln lost, as you know, that 1858 Senate race to Douglas, but did win the Republican nomination for presidency two years later. Um, at the Chicago National Convention held in what was called the Wigwam uh, in downtown Chicago. Back in Springfield, Lincoln anxiously awaited the results of his friend's endeavors. He stayed in Springfield, didn't go to the convention. In an attempt to relieve some of that nervousness, he, uh, he played a, uh, joined in a game of fives, an early variation of handball, and it would have been up in this block here. This is the, uh, the east side of the state capitol square, and so he played fives in the next block up here. When Lincoln learned that James Conkling had returned early uh, from the convention, he went to Conkling's law office on the west side of the State House Square to learn what had transpired. Lincoln stretched out on a settee and carefully listened to Conkling's description of the convention, then stated, quote, well, Conkling, I believe I'll go back to my office and practice law. <laughs> Later that day, the results of the convention voting started to arrive at Springfield through the Telegraph office. Now, that was on the north side of the square. Lincoln captured the nomination on the third vote, received the congratulations of all assembled at the Telegraph office, but then excused himself from the group stating, quote, well, gentlemen, there's a little woman at our house who's probably more interested in this dispatch than I am. <laughs> Word of Lincoln's nomination spread quickly through Springfield, and guns were fired in celebration, and friends called on the Lincolns at their home all afternoon. A rally was held later that evening at the State House, followed by a marching band procession to the Lincoln home. Lincoln commented that he would invite the crowd in if it was large enough to hold them, but he could merely invite as many as could find room. At that point, a member of the group, anticipating the next presidential inauguration, shouted, we will give you a larger house on the 4th of next March. <laughs> a large Republican rally took place on, on uh, August 8th that included a parade and a wide variety of floats that wound through the streets of Springfield and paused in front of the Lincoln home. There's Lincoln there in the white suit. On election day, November 6, 1860, Lincoln left his state house office. State house office. He, had, he had borrowed a room in the state capitol, crossed 6th Street, and entered the county courthouse at the southeast corner of 6th and Washington Street, where he cast his ballot with his name removed and promptly returned to his office. Lincoln's law partner, Herndon, recalled the scene at the county courthouse, and this was the uh, county courthouse on the east side of the square. You can't see it, it's just behind the trees there in the photograph. Herndon said, the crowd around the polls opened a gap as the distinguished voter approached, and some even removed their hats as he deposited his ticket and announced in a subdued voice his name, Abraham Lincoln, as if no one in the room knew who he was. Lincoln then went home for dinner, and later that evening joined other Republicans who filled the uh, State, Rep State House Representatives Hall uh, to wait the election returns. Now the preliminary um, results came in from what was called the Old Northwest, but the Midwest now, uh, and, and those states anticipated to Lincoln, went to Lincoln. Um, Pennsylvania reported later in the evening, and once Pennsylvania reported to gone for Lincoln, it was a pretty safe bet that, that the, uh, Lincoln was gonna win the election, but Lincoln wanted to hear 
from New York and what New, which way New York went. And so the group was invited to wait for the New York return to Watson's saloon where, where they had supper waiting, and that's where he received, received word. Again, historian Paul Angle described the scene that followed. He said, at the New York returns, the crowd at the State House went mad. Old men and young men, bankers and clerks, slapped each other on the back, danced, sang, and yelled until their voices sank to hoarse whispers. Outside, one long shout announced the news. From stores, from houses, even from housetops, men called out that New York was safe. While groups ran through the streets shouting their joy at having joined the Republicans, never had Springfield seen anything like it. Now, Mary had joined her husband for most of the evening, but, uh, uh, but had gone home prior to the New York returns. And about 1.30 in the morning then, Abraham Lincoln proceeded home announcing, Mary, Mary, we are elected. <laughs> now the Lincolns hosted one last gathering at their home on the evening of February 6, 1861. They opened their doors, they opened the front door at 7 p.m. and greeted well-wishers well past midnight, just a constant stream of people coming through the house. Uh, St. Louis, Missouri Democrat reported the event and said, Quote, Mr. Lincoln threw open his house for a general reception of all the people who felt disposed to give him and his lady a parting call. The levee lasted from 7 to 12 o'clock in the evening, and the house thronged by thousands up to a late hour. Mr. Lincoln received the guests as they entered and were made known. They then passed on and were introduced to Mrs. Lincoln, who stood near the center of the parlors, and who, I must say, acquitted herself most gracefully and admirably. Two days, late, two days after the farewell reception, the Lincolns stayed at the Chenery House Hotel, vacated their home of 17 years. On the morning of February 11th, a carriage arrived at the Chenery House driven by Lincoln's neighbor, Jameson Jenkins, who was also a conductor on the Underground Railroad, lived about four doors down from the Lincolns, uh, and took Lincoln to the train station. A crowd said to have gathered, numbered about 1,000 gathered to see Lincoln off. Lincoln passed through the gathering of friends and neighbors, shaking hands with as many as he could, and then waited at the Great Western Railroad Station uh, for his departure. Just before 8 o'clock in the morning, Lincoln addressed the gathering from the back of the train. He didn't really plan to say anything, but, but was moved with their turnout. Um, and he reflected on his years in Springfield and those challenges that awaited him in Washington. The Illinois State Journal reported the event. It was a most impressive scene. We have known Mr. Lincoln for many years. We have heard him speak upon a hundred different occasions. We have never saw him so profoundly affected. Nor did he ever utter an address which seemed to us so, as full of simple and touching eloquence, so exactly adapted to the occasion, so worthy of the man and the hour. At precisely eight o'clock city time, the train moved off, bearing our honored townsman, our noble chief, Abraham Lincoln, to the scenes of his future labors and, as we firmly believe, his glorious triumph. God bless honest Abraham Lincoln. Now, as you might guess, that was the Republican paper. Uh, the Democratic <laughs> paper said, and they, they cited his farewell address in its entirely, but the Democratic paper says, well, he said something, it was raining, we couldn't really hear him, and then the train left. So, uh, so partisan newspaper reporting uh, at that time. So just for the next few minutes, I want to basically talk about get up to today in the neighborhood. Of course, Lincoln went off uh, as president during the Civil War. A war for union turned into a war for emancipation. And you'll hear about that next month. Only to be assassinated um, within days of Lee's surrender. He was, Lincoln was assassinated. And then a funeral train came back to Springfield, basically uh, following his inaugural route. And so, you know, that assassination prompted, in large part, the places you've learned about through this winter up until today, because all of a sudden, you couldn't go shake hands with Lincoln. How, so then how, where do you go to learn about this man? How do you connect with Abraham Lincoln? Well, you go to the places where Lincoln lived, where, and so that was the time that when all of these places you've learned about started to, to interest people. And this is the old state capitol draped in mourning at the time of the funeral. Uh, here's mourners lined up to, to view Lincoln and Springfield. Uh, here's the home draped in mourning, and and group after group posed for photographs. And you, it's really it's cut off here, but there's a there's an advertisement right down there. So some uh, clever businessman in Springfield took some prime uh, advertising space there. But then people kept coming, as you know, to the Lincoln home. Uh, this was the home in the 1880s. 
Um, Osborne Oldroyd was a renter of the Lincoln home, and he put in stuff for people to look at. He, he was renting from Robert, renting the home still at this time. That's Oldroyd there. And he um, uh, charged admission. He sold this card that went along with the artifacts. Um, so this guy didn't like that much. So he, uh, he donated the home to the state of Illinois in 1887 on the condition that it be well maintained and free of access. Um, so people kept coming. This is the home about, I'm just going to show some pictures and go through these pretty quickly. This is the Lincoln home about 1899. Uh, now keep in mind this time the historic side is just the house. A postcard from 1900, so you see utility lines going in. There's a trolley track. We're looking north up 8th Street. There's a Lincoln home right there. Plans came and went for what to do with that neighborhood. The early plans, the city beautiful movement during the progressive era said, well, let's just tear down all that old stuff. Uh, there's the Lincoln home there. We'll put in reflecting pools and landscape yards and classical architecture and things like that. Um, so here's the Lincoln home in the 1920s, the formal parlor and the sitting room, uh, 1930s. By this time, the state of Illinois realized the house needed some attention. It needed a little extra care. Um, and they were ready to restore it. But then the US involvement in World War II uh, diverted, of course, all resources to the war effort. So plans for the Lincoln home were put on hold. Uh, 1940s. So 1950s then. Um, archaeology was done in the backyard of the Lincoln home in preparation for restoration. Um, I always tell kids there's Indiana Jones <laughs> stopping to see what was found there in that probably a privy pit there. Uh, and work was done on the Lincoln home in the 1950s by the state of Illinois. Uh, another plan uh, for the Lincoln neighborhood, let's just put the train here right next to the Lincoln home. Why not? Uh, but by the 1960s then attitudes towards historic preservation were changing and, and the Historic Preservation Act of 1966. So the idea of context, putting a neighborhood in, became, became more important. This was the City of Springfield plan from 1966. Uh, but this is what the neighborhood was looking like at that same time. Um, as you might guess, gift shops and, and apartment buildings and things like that. The National Park Service was asked to come in and take a look at this area in the late 1960s to see if they'd be interested in creating a four block national historic site. So here's the footprints of the buildings that were there, both modern and historic. Here's what they determined were footprints of the historic buildings. And those uh, are familiar with Civil War uh, scholars and, and uh, knows who, a little bit about the Civil War. Uh, Ed Bars was the one who did a lot of the early research for the Lincoln Home area. He's a great, great Civil War scholar. Uh, here's what the Park Service would do with the property. Uh, create a visitor center, basically focusing on 8th Street. Here's the Lincoln home for the restoration. Uh, President Nixon came in August 1971 to sign legislation authorizing the establishment of Lincoln Home National Historic Site at what was then the newly restored Old State Capitol, State Historic Site, on the desk that uh, Lincoln used to work on his first inaugural address. Paul Finley was a congressman who, who worked hard to get legislation passed. Uh, Governor Ogilvy, um, basically the state donated everything it owned, including the home and the artifacts. The city of Springfield donated everything it owned, including the city streets, things like that. Interestingly enough, President Nixon, um, you know, this is only about four blocks from the Lincoln home, but he never came to the Lincoln home. He, uh, he went out to the state fair and did a little campaigning and then took off. So he, he created us, but he never visited us. <laughs> so this is the four block Lincoln Home National Historic Site, basically the way it looks today. The shaded area is the National Register of Historic Places Historic District. So there's the Lincoln Home Visitor Center. Um, there would have been homes, and that's the nice thing about the brochure you have that shows the bird's eye view of the neighborhood. That shows that this would have been a full neighborhood in 1860, but what we have here is basically the historic structures that, that survived over the years. Now I'm going to go through some before and afters of some of the restorations that were done, uh, and then, then we'll, we'll wrap up. This is uh, the, uh, what we call the Lion House, it was actually restored before the Park Service took over. Uh, Julius Rosenwald lived there as a young boy, of Sears and Roebuck fame. And so uh, the Rosenwald Foundation shipped in a little money to the city to have them restore the house uh, in 1970. And there's a nice connection there, of course, with the story with the Rosenwald schools throughout the South. 
um, to, to give, um, at least make an effort towards giving African American students a decent place to learn throughout the South is what Julius Rosenwald worked hard to do. Um, our visitor center was completed in 1977. There's any day in May with all those school buses. Uh, the Shut House, before and after, 1982. Senator uh, Durbin rents that for his Springfield office, the historic leasing program we have there. That's the Beetle House. Uh, we name it for whoever lived there in 1860. That's before and after, 1984. Uh, of course, people kept coming to the Lincoln home during all this time, and here's people lining up. So the home was also re restored in 19. Uh, 88 reopened in June of 1988. Uh, it had been 30 years since the last major restoration. So work was done. Archaeology, uh, more steel was put in, uh, climate control, HVAC was put in for the first time, air conditioning for the first time, things like that. So, it, so again, reopened in June of 1988. Now this photograph is kind of fun. So here's a Les, Frank Leslie's drawing of a formal parlor uh, in 1860, and then here's, here it is today. So we, Pretty good. Uh, the Shut House, done in 1991. And most of these houses are office space. So we're really only looking at getting some context in the neighborhood and adaptive reuse of the interiors. And the lease money helps us keep the properties up then too. 1993, the Robinson House. Uh, the Dean House was restored as museum exhibit space. Those models I showed you earlier, those are in this exhibit case or in this exhibit space, I should say. The Arnold House was another one that has exhibit space in it. That one is, it, the exhibits are on historic preservation and restoration, why we do it, and how we do it, and those kinds of things. Sprig House, see that little box? That's the historic house that we restored in 1998. All that rest of that had to come off. The house just kept getting added to over the years. Um, of course, I say we as if I was out there with a hammer and up on the roof or anything. But, uh, uh, the Corneau House was done in 2001. We hope to put children's exhibits in that. It's right on the intersection right there. Uh, the Du Bois House is a good one. Our maintenance staff has that for their office now. It used to be the maintenance staff had the worst looking building in the park. Now they've got finally the best, one of the nicest ones. Uh, the Morse House, that's a nice one. Uh, and, and then, of course, as you guys well know, um, restoring is one thing, maintaining is quite another, and so the work never ends. So, so our maintenance staff does a great job of, of not only sometimes restoring these buildings, but also then maintaining them, uh, which is a never-ending battle. And, and all of that goes to setting a scene, setting a context, so visitors coming in can start to maybe take themselves back and more receptive to hearing stories about Lincoln. And that's where then, the, of course, the interpreters take over with these wonderful settings and scenes to start telling these stories of, of the Lincoln family and, and, and the coming Civil War and what that meant. And so the visitors can kind of slowly then start working themselves back to, to learn and connect with and hopefully appreciate the challenges that, that the Lincoln family had, um, challenges, successes, joys, sorrows, all those things that the Lincoln family and any family would have if they spend 17 years in one place. Thank you. We have time for some questions? Yes, sir. Do you have any knowledge of the requirements for the practice law in Illinois at that particular time of Lincoln? It was, it was pretty loose. Um, you went before a judge. Uh, you had somebody vouch for your character, first of all. I think a judge might have asked you a few questions. That was really about it. There was no bar exam, per se. And I don't know if that was indicative, just you know, what was then the frontier, if that was you know, maybe here it was a little more rigid or formal. But out there, it was, it was fairly loose. Um, in the brochure, there uh, when he got elected president and moved out of the house, it says that they sold some of the furniture. Did they ever uh, track all that down and get it all back the way it was originally uh, when they lived there, everything? We, no. We have 
probably about 52 original Lincoln pieces in the house. That's out of about 2,000 artifacts. But some of the bigger, bigger furniture is original. Um, the, the family the Lincolns rented the house to, the Tilton family, bought a lot of the furniture for their house. Well, then in, in uh, 1867, they left the Lincoln home and took what was then their furniture up to Chicago. Well, you know, they had a little fire up there in 1871. So some of that Lincoln furniture burned in the great Chicago fire. Um, I want to ask you about the picture. I, I've never seen much jewelry to do with Abraham Lincoln. Therefore, it shows the pictures. He's got a ring on his finger. Oh, and I have never yeah. noticed. Uh, do you know anything about it? Was it a double ring ceremony when they got married? The ring on his finger, where it shows him married. I uh, think the pictures so. Uh, I yeah. think so. I'll find it here, and I'll ask another. I'll see if there's another question. We'll look for it. Was, I, yeah. I thought, when you showed the map of the four block area, uh -huh. is that the Edwards house where they were married and where Mary died, is that included in that four block area? Has that been restored or was it demolished? The, the Edwards house stood on what was now the Capitol building, the current Capitol building. It was torn down by the state of Illinois in the early 1900s to build another state building. Um, what we have in the park, you may have noticed a similar looking building, is actually a three-quarter scale version of the Edwards House that was built before the National Park Service acquired the area. Um, it was three-quarter scale because that's how wide the lot was where they built this museum basically where you could go in and see a recreated parlor. For years I had people come in and come up and, and say, well, where was the house the Lincolns were married? And, and I'd say, well, that was, and I ex explained to them what I just explained to you, that this one's not the real thing, and we don't use it that way anymore. And they look at me like, man, I am lying to them, because they remember <laughs> going into that parlor and seeing, well, and I look later at pictures, and you really had to read the fine print on the sign outside that house to know that it wasn't the, the, real, the real thing. So, so that's, that's what happened in the original Edwards house. I, I remember the first time I went to the house, in, in Springfield, and I wanted to go for years and years and years and years, and I got off the train from Chicago and, and made my way over to Jackson Street. And as I came around the corner, the whole house was covered with scaffolding. And I was so disappointed. You were there in 1987 or 88. Yeah. And, uh, but the thing that was really cool was is that they were scraping the house to have it repainted, and the thing that, that you could see, and, and I was aware of was you could see all the joints and all the joists where they um, put the second floor on, mm -hmm. which was, would have been covered if it had all been repainted. Uh, yeah. And you could see all the architecture of how the second story was put on. Uh -huh. It was really fascinating. Oh, yeah. So, so this, this right here, here, huh? Yeah. 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 That is interesting. He, he uh, only other jewelry I know that he wore, and he made one for Tad. Uh, his watch fob, uh, the pocket watch, had a log with an axe drove into the log, uh, denoting the rails. And he made in Tadmore one too. I've got a colored engraving where you can see uh, those watch fobs. Yeah, yeah. Did you know? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. Was it typical in those days in the death notice adding a no mention of Mrs. Lincoln whatsoever? It's interesting. Must have been. Must have been. Yeah. That that Mary's name wasn't mentioned in that death notice of Eddie, just Mr. Lincoln's name. And I, you know, quite frankly, I hadn't thought about it, but it probably. Yeah. 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 There was. Um, in fact, we think it's Reverend Brown, who was uh, an African American minister. Um, I don't know if I'll. He, uh, he's in that line of mourners waiting to go in. And there's other pictures, funeral pictures you may have seen, where someone's holding Lincoln's horse in front of the home draped in mourning. And that was also um, uh, Reverend Brown.
find myself now anxious for Lincoln to be dead so I can show you that picture. That's not very nice. And, uh, while I'm looking for that, is there other, other questions? Yeah. Um, I was wondering your inside perspective on Abraham Lincoln was not the only president in our history who's been assassinated. He's not the most, he's not the only eloquent president we've ever had, not the only president we've ever had who fought for equality or rights of the lesser man. Yet, to this day, the, the mythic nature of Lincoln, the world over, what, in your opinion, makes him stand out from everyone else who's held, held that same position to where people from as far away as Hong Kong can recite the Gettysburg Address? Yeah. It, and, and people talk about that and wonder about it, you know, and it seems like it's, it's, it's maybe it's a combination of all those things you just said that come together in one, in one man, um, you know, leading this country. Any, any president who's a, a war president becomes pretty, pretty famous and well-remembered. Um, but here's a guy who also then was assassinated on top of that. Just at the very, you know, he just, he just won the thing, you know, and then, and then assassinated. The, the, the idea of Lincoln representing this, this self-made man uh, that was very popular, of course, in Robert's generation, as well as Lincoln's generation of, of these guys coming, do, achieving on their own. Uh, and Lincoln was a great advocate of that through, um, you know, maintaining the system of democracy and why he hated slavery so much is people should be free to achieve as much as they can achieve without any interferences. Um, and so I think that resonates around the world. You know, Lincoln and, and others, of course, at this time period recognized not only um, you know, the end of, of slavery, but the preservation of democracy. This was still an experiment out here. You know? and, and when the Civil War broke out, it was kind of looked at as by some in Europe, the, the monarchies in Europe said, look, see that democracy thing? That, that's not going to work because now they're killing each other. And, and Lincoln and, and, as I say, others knew that, that you ha we had to hang on to this system. We had to preserve the Union to preserve democracy. Um, and then Lincoln, of course, as skillfully as a politician, then knew the timing for emancipation and, and things like that. So I, it, it seems to me, anyway, it was kind of this, all these things coming together in one, in one man. Mm -hmm.